wako kia na mui au si. Ini nui au na katsuko us Rina Catherine Ramsey. In a sapni hanyuat imem imem wapaya tad ki kalau ki cepel lekut ka nunum hitam and was ka ki pi angkun ki kalau winikit ki sipem wah mia atpem wah help nisnem haulah haulah pem nunah ke us kasi yau ya hanyuat nunum pest kem imwas aits niwas pa. Tats a imena wunikt patsuk wunai tach wach bahat au yai tach. Tats a imem mi khato wat painach. Tats a imena nakt a patwit nai tach kina wadis pa. Kem ka us eis ni was ba hit twit nai tanach. Tats ein hept an nats nim. Nuna ka psi tzwik nas wap nat nim. Kel ka us nun a wap nat sich. Kika ki mam hi nas ka psi tzwi yu tanach. Ka wad met nats ni kukun ka psi tzwit. Met ka psi tzwik nach a nats na ketem nunach ka us. La am ki ka us na shi yau nam. Ka ti yau yau wani kit ki pasipim wach mi atspim wach hau nisnim hau lach hau lach nim nunach ka us. Okay. Okay. Um, I'm going to share a quote from Tafoya, um, something that Sean Wilson shared in research ceremony. And um, as we're opening this up for prayer and discussion, I think this sets up um, the importance of story and the power of place. Stories go in circles. They don't go in straight lines. It helps if you listen in circles, because there are stories inside and between stories. And finding your way through them is as easy and as hard as finding your way home. Part of finding is getting lost. And when you are lost, you start to open up and listen. So thank you for forming our semi-circle. <laughs> Creator, thank you for this time that we are all here together. I thank you for each of the women on this panel, Dr. Georgia Johnson and all the contacts and um, people she mentioned. Thank you for just making this possible for us to be here in this space and this room and this time. Dr. Rodney Fry, thank you for inviting us as well. Um, I'm grateful and I look forward to the time today to share with you um, the work I had the privilege of being a part of. I too am very grateful to be here. Y quiero hablar en español porque me siento cómoda hablando en español. Um, quiero agradecerle a mi mamá por darme la oportunidad de darme todas las lecciones y toda la fortaleza que tengo ahora es gracias a mi mamá. And I said, you know, thank you for my my mother is the only the person that that I thank first and foremost, and so the creator and for allowing me to be here in this space with everybody, and for all of you to for being here, being part of this circle. Thank you, everyone, for being here. Um, I was just touched by Chavez's prayer and, and thanks to her mom, and um, and thank you, Angel, for directing us. Um, I also want to thank Georgia and Pam and also Rodney. Um, I think for this panel to come together it took a lot of um, a lot of effort and we may not have seen them out behind the scenes so I just want to say thank you and appreciate everybody who's, who's done you know the, their share and, um, and just to be grateful thankful to also the, the women in my family who have uh, persevered and um, before me and the women before them and the women before them are ancestors an ancestral knowledge that has been passed down from generation to generation I truly believe is you know, what's brought me here to where I'm at to question and um, stand before the academy and um, yeah, so I'm real appreciative of that, and so always, you know, appreciative to other women, the the sisterhood that's established, and that's essentially what we formed here, and um, I'm just real appreciative of that. So thank you for joining us and wanting to hear our story, because that's what we're here to tell you is our story in this journey, this educational journey that's really um, tried us and and also made us 
become better at what we're doing and um, we're, we're helping each other but also at the, co the community level and even society at large we're, we're going to make a difference and so thank you for joining us. Okay, Wakokia um, Uyasuk. Now we're beginning of. Uh, I think you're going to hear the, the, the quote tonight uh, research is ceremony um, from what we learned with, from um, Sean Wilson. And um, we began, we opened up with prayer because uh, you never know with what's going to happen in the circle with what we, we say. Our words are powerful. And so when we're. This is ceremony that's taking place right now because anything here that can happen today is very powerful and you can learn, learn from it. And so that's why we, had, we open up with prayer to, to bless what we're, we're doing today. Um, and then we have behind us, we have our ancestors and our own family, which we show respect, respect for. Uh, we have a responsibility in what we say. And so that's why we also bless, bless this night, it's our responsibility that what we say is uh, is hopefully going to. I think that might be my son. But, uh, <laughs> oh, oh. <laughs> not that. <laughs> There's my son. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and so, anyhow, my son Peyton is here, but we have a responsibility for what what we say, and then Delisa is his um, cousin and also his teacher. So we have a big responsibility here, here tonight. But um, when we're showing our pictures of our ancestors, uh, it's like their spirits are here. We're showing respect and we're showing, uh, we're uh, given that reciprocity. Uh, they shared their stories, their ways of knowing with us and then it's our responsibility to bring that forward to have it continue on. Um, I began with uh, my grandma's prayer, Rena Catherine Ramsey. Uh, she's my Katsa, my Katsa is my um, grandma, grandma from my mother's side. And she used to say the Lord's Prayer in, um, in um, Nimi Patimpiki, the people's language at all these different gatherings. So this was something that was given to me and I, I have that responsibility now to share it and to, and to pass it on. I can't keep that gift to myself. That was a gift given to me, and I, I, have, to sh I have to share it with others. Uh, my grandmother was a storyteller, a, a weaver, um, a whip woman, and uh, she had a big influence on my life. And my other grandma, uh, Louise, she was a bead, bead, she did bead work, but it was my grandma Catherine, my Katza, uh, from that line where I'm going to share some stories about my great grand grandfather Sam Lott. But how I want to begin with my my little talk is to, we talked about this, this concept of the, the wagon wheel and the different spokes and, and so we wanted to come up with our, our own metaphors which I think you're going you're gonna to hear more of tonight and one metaphor of course um, Maria, Chave and I are wearing our metaphors <laughs> and um, this is the metaphor of our wapsis, our braid and um, and so this is, represents all the different knowledge that you need, you can't have one left out, or it wouldn't be that brave, but together it's, it's, it's something that is really strong and it holds that knowledge. And so I want to share this with you. This is another big kind of metaphor that I'm pulling out right here. <laughs> but um, my Nakats, uh, my grandma, she, she started this. And of course, uh, I get emotional sometimes talking about her. But what can bring me out of it is a story. Every time I think of Delisa and my grandma, I always laugh because um, Delisa shared a story about uh, her and Josiah being with my grandma. And grandma looked down at Delisa's toes and she's like, oh. Delisa had a toe ring on. And my grandma <laughs> just thought that was just the funniest thing. So when I think of my grandma and Delisa, that's what I think of. <laughs> but. Um, my grandma passed away, Nakats, um, she passed away in 1990, um, 99, and Ella, she passed away in 1998. But when she passed away, we have giveaway. And when they were given things away, I, we have five sisters, 
and I wasn't one, or my sisters, we weren't one that received one of my grandma's corn husks. And I was, I was of course, pretty sad that that didn't happen. My grandma, she taught me how to weave with yarn, but when it came to the corn, it was just this different twist that seemed like it only twisted my mind. I could never get it, it only twisted my mind. So what ended up happening is um, we didn't get her corn husk bags, but what we got is we got her starts. And so this is my grandma's start, and you can tell her work from mine. Her start is this, this dark brown part down here. This is my grandma's start. And so I took her, her start, and I already knew somewhat of weaving, but when you added the, the corn, it was just that other different twist. So I helped um, my sister, Joy, she helped me, because she got that twist, and my nephew, Kellen, he got that twist. Maynard Labrador got that twist. Some of our best weavers are the men. And so finally I started getting that twist. So this was just hers, just down here. Well, where do I go from here? And so I added on to my grandma's story and I took it and I come up, up here. And so this is both my grandma and I. But she left this, this legacy, and it's our responsibility to pick it up and to bring it forward, to move it forward. And so I'm moving forward. And so it was this blessing in disguise that I didn't receive one because I received something much greater. Is that this is this is our work together. And so, like these, every single one. This is also the metaphor. Is that we can't have one of these things missing. One of the spokes on this missing. Because if you do, then the design's not going to be pretty. It's not going to work. And so these all represent. Our, our knowledge. Every, every we talked about every race, every group of people has knowledge, and our indigenous knowledge is in here as well. And it's counted. It's it's useful, and we need to make sure we we include it in everything that we do. Because if you don't, it doesn't create this pretty picture that you have here. And so this is my responsibility to carry it forward. One of the things about this, um, of course, it's not a perfect thing, but once it comes together at the end, you know, then it's, it, this is how we are as people, we're not perfect, <laughs> but you know, at the end we're all whole people and we do make, make a, a pretty gift, we are make a pretty package. One of the things I like about these is that you look at this, we call it kakapa, corn husk, and, um, but you have this pretty beautiful design, but you just never know what, what's going on with the person, what's happening with that person, and then you flip it over and you have this whole new Mm -hmm. whole new beautiful thing that's going on. I think that's just just a lot of power in that. There's just a lot of power in that. So this is my, my grandma's work and my, my Ella, she was a bead worker and so this is supposed to be part of a, a, a baby board and my baby's uh, fall four, she's gonna be five now. <laughs> But when I started this, after she was born, I had no time to finish it. So I'm still going to give it to her, but um, it's going to be for her babies. <laughs> <laughs> and so uh, Sam Lott, that is my great-grandfather. And Sam Lott was a historian. He's my, he's my grandma's, uh, my, my grandma's, my Kotzit's dad. He was an interpreter for L.V. McWhorter. And he helped on the books, Hear Me My Chiefs and Yellow Wolf's His Own Story. But he shared that oral tradition and he passed it on. One of the things about our oral tradition is um, our elders, our Titakas, they really, they really took good care of the stories and they, um, they checked each other. And so like when in research you're, you're checking you know, to make sure things are right. But what they did is these number threes, um, three times, three times I tell you, this is the truth, three times I tell you. They told stories, they made sure they had their witnesses there because that was, the, the, that was like one of the, the rules. You have the, the people there so that they could serve as witness and that made sure that they got the, the story right. And so that really, really um, held true with all of our oral traditions is that people were there to, to witness it. Um, I want to touch a little bit on another power, that powerful number three, and that's with our um, our MOU, uh, our memorandum memorandum of understanding, which I believe Renee is going to uh, focus a little bit more on. 
but I also want to give my acknowledge because, acknowledgements because we have three, that powerful three, which is Georgia, Jan, and Rodney. They've been very powerful three for all of us and for me uh, because they understand that MOU and they really made it work for me and they made it work for others too. They really, uh, I really appreciate what you have did with, with that MOU because I wouldn't be here really without the, the MOU and without people believing and carrying on. That's a treaty. That's another treaty. And they, they took this treaty and they're, they're wanting to live, have this tre treaty be a living treaty. And so I really appreciate you honoring that treaty. It's very, very important. And so this is the power, powerful three that I wanted to uh, pay tribute to. And so I think uh, I think I made all of my, my points that I, I wanted to make in my little presentation. Um, sometimes we have presentations where we have to speak an hour or three hours, and it goes like that. And so I know I'm not sure how I did in my time. But uh, anyhow, um, <clears throat> My name is Delisa, and um, before I speak, I'll just kind of situate myself so you understand me as a researcher. Um, I'm Mimi Pu. Uh, my parents are both teachers. They graduated from um, the College of Education that I will be graduating from next year. Um, I was a baby vandal. So this is my home. Um, I, I got my master's degree from WSU, though. Go <laughs> Cougs. Sorry. Um, and my undergrad from LC. So um, I've, I've been around the colleges in this area. And um, when I met Dr. Johnson was when I fell into education. And, um, <laughs> <laughs> um, and it was um, one of those phone calls I made to my dad because I um, um, have a degree in science and did my first year grad school in science. And then that bug hit me. I think it's genetic. And I called my dad and said, guess what? I'm gonna get my master's in ed, and this is a this is a complete cultural sound. You all know it. My dad went, ugh, because he's an educator and he knows what it's like. But being that, I went to a tribal school on the Coeur d'Alene Res. Um, I feel like um, where I have ended up in my life is exactly how things are supposed to play out. And I've got my student there. It looked like he was recording us. I won't make any funny faces, Peyton. Um, he promises not to tell stories tomorrow. Um, I ended up in education, and um, how I viewed my own schooling um, and how I was successful wasn't an issue. So when you're building, you're thinking about your worldview and your own indigeneity, and you're wondering, how do I um, situate myself and represent what's happening in my classroom and what I feel like is happening and how I want to be a positive change agent when I myself didn't really have any conundrums um, graduated with honors, um, Quill uh, School um, Society, Honor Society. I mean, I didn't have any of these these things. And so Georgia and I had to talk about where should my story begin? Because I can't really talk about Head Start, and um, I don't have the same experience as even my own students or in my own community. Um, and it really started when Georgia asked me to be a part of her um, Two World View environmental um, education. Um, teacher workshop and I was on the other side of it. I was not the teacher in the workshop. I was the, um, I don't know what I was. <laughs> Thank you. Um, you went to Costco a lot. I did. <laughs> her errand girl. And, and I started to, I, tell, I told her I just feel like I'm on this other spectrum of where she was bringing these teachers. And I was over here, but I wasn't the teacher. And I, I can't articulate what I'm feeling and what, and what we're creating. And she said that's, that's that transformative piece that's missing. And, I, and then the bug when I knew where my place was. And so for that's 13 years, um, I've been an educator on my reservation, um, teaching fifth grade. Um, and where my research, um, the heart of my research is culturally responsive, culturally relevant, culturally resonant learning experiences for my students. And I teach in a public school 
and Idaho people, so you know what that's like um, for me right now um, on a reservation. So um, what I wanted to share with you is um, what I see in my classroom and my students and how being, um, I don't know how to throw out the terms, this is part of our indigeneity and us playing and reforming and decolonizing terminology. Um, you can call it cultural competency, you can call it cultural responsiveness, you can call it culturally based education, you can call it place based education. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure yet what, uh, I'm still defining that. That's why I, I'm in this academy right now to figure this out for myself. But I wanted to share with you um, the core of what I see happening in my classroom is completely tied to sense of place, um, our community, our values. Um, all of that is something I see is a magical dynamic that Peyton and I have, um, not because you know we're related or know each other, but because there is something about me being in that classroom and facilitating the learning and where he's at that we get each other and what we do is on such a totally different level than what's happening in another public school. And how can I be a positive change agent, and this is where Georgia um, often slaps me, is I can't decide where um, I want to develop the curriculum, and this is my research question now, but I see the gap in teacher prep, mm -hmm. and right now I have a student teacher in my classroom, and they are getting scored actually on the evaluations. We, we did this, this is her assignment this week on are they culturally um, responsive? And thank goodness that she and I landed together because that experience for her is huge. But there are so many other student teachers who don't know how to access that and don't know best practices. And you can do more harm than good. So this is where I see myself on the teacher prep side. And um, right now I'm in curriculum and instruction. Um, but I'm still tied to this sense of place and that relation, the relationality of what I know is happening in my school and in my classroom. And that story, the stories, Peyton, you just heard his mother. So the, what I hear come out of my children in my classroom, I just tell Georgia, how do we bottle this up? And just, um, it's tied to sense of place and story. So um, I have my teacher hat on because that's my passion. Um, but like uh, Renee had mentioned, there are challenges um, in choosing and knowing that the right path for you is an indigenous research framework and a paradigm. And you would just love to pull some lit review and just follow somebody else's yellow brick road, but it's not there. Mm -hmm. And that's where I'm struggling because I'm laying the bricks. And that's where I feel like I, I, um, I had to take a month off. I told Georgia, I'm still here. I'm just, <sighs> because that's, I'm, I tell her, I think my metaphor is I'm on the front lines right now, you know? I am on the front lines. I am, that's where I'm at every day. And so I see it that up, up close. And um, how we pull in the stories of me as the storyteller, as the researcher, and my, um, our discoveries as the storytelling. This is what I'd, I'd like to share with you. And I hate reading. I quoted myself because it's all me. I was like, I'm so proud of me. <laughs> um, but I just, this, this articulates better. Um, I want to share with you story as research, which is a part of that indigeneity. You guys have heard this. <laughs> pretend you haven't. Um, our indigenous research paradigm is premised in stories. We live our lives immersed in story. We all have our own story to tell. How the story is told is up to the individual storyteller. Storytellers have a responsibility when they carry a story because stories have power. Stories can have global commonalities, but still be very local and specific to indigenous communities. That's where I come in. There's no yellow brick road. It's happening only in my classroom. Um, Stories can be anecdotal in nature or become complex parables. Some stories are filtered and retold through the eyes of others. Stories can be open for interpretation, misrepresented, and sometimes exploited. I should change sometimes. Exploited. 
In indigenous cultures, stories carry knowledge passed down since time immemorial. In indigenous research, the researchers tell a story from an indigenous perspective, so it is very important how we respectfully situate that story. And I want to tie that into the scholars, um, for example, Sean Wilson. Um, he states that indigenous research, the researcher is a storyteller. And that's how I view myself um, in my indigenous research paradigm. He states we're not objects or neutral observers. So he solved my positionality problem. Um, we are storytellers because, as Sean Wilson states, we cannot remove ourselves from our world in order to examine it. Thank you. I won't. Um, our research will tell an important story, not only for our people, for of our people, but for our people. And this is something that I began to understand. The aha moment for me was Linda Tahiwa Smith and her decolonizing methodology. She's Maori. I read it. I had nightmares. And I went, wow, <laughs> if I had read this 10 years ago, where would I be? I'm just reading it now. Darn it. But that's, you know, hindsight. She articulated the things that I felt but couldn't describe. And that's where my decolonizing journey, I realized, oh, I have been decolonizing myself, but now I can tell you <laughs> where it began. And OK, I'm becoming scholarly. So this is my learning trajectory. Um, and what else did I want to share? Oh, uh, this, this um, the importance of, and I'm not sure how much uh, when we're using certain terms, one of my favorite terms is besides incommensurable, <laughs> is decolonization. And just looking at, in my classroom, I'm very proud of my students, Peyton um, and his classmates showed me today, um, that we are critical thinkers and critical readers, and that everything that we look at in whatever textbook or whatever I give them, or a newspaper, or wherever in the world, we have to deconstruct it. Um, we have to decolonize it. Um, and, and, and we've had to practice that because we don't see ourselves in what's presented in our standards even. Um, so for so long, our story has been told for us through Western ideologies linked to European imperialism and colonialism. And this is something um, that's not our story. It has been our story, but I'm choosing not to follow that, that road. Um, <clears throat> so I came across a a person, their name is Rigney, and I know I've got my lit review. I don't have it memorized. But <laughs> one of my um, most powerful quotes, um, I was just trying to grab tidbits of how I could tell you where my brain is and as I'm constructing um, my journey and um, framing my research. Um, at the center of indigenous research is the impetus to tell our own story. and. Rigney states that indigenous people are at a stage where they want research and research design to contribute to their self-determination and liberation struggles as it is defined and controlled by their own communities. So in the original indigenous theories um, course that I took with Dina and Jane and Yo and um, Arthur and, um, oh, the PowerPoint's not up there. Um, part of what you're looking at um, was a presentation we gave to the College of Graduate Studies and then to the um, International um, Internal Review Board. Right, but the Diversity and Education oh, Conference at WSU. Right. Globalization. And when we were doing that and thinking about what the cores were, you're going to see those strong three uh, respect, relationality, and reciprocity. And in this quote is where I see that reciprocity. Because we are defining and controlling what happens in our community. Um, the questions are springing forth through us. And it has really changed the dynamic of how IRB and tribal protocol and who owes, owns what rights to what research and who it benefits. And any research that we do has to benefit the community but it also needs to come from the community. And that's also where my heart lies in education. And so I know any of us that are working with uh, tribes, like even myself, um, I'm not so much worried about UI IRB as I am worried about um, communicating to our, our um, council of elders and my own tribe um, 
what I'm doing is needed and acceptable and will bring forth good. And, and I, I'm a member of this community. And this is something that has completely changed. That's the importance. I think Renee might be touching on that. So I'm an educator. Um, this is my second year um, in my PhD program in curriculum and instruction. And when Angel and I talked last night, she mentioned metaphors. And um, I didn't have the opportunity, just with some family circumstances, to meet with these ladies and kind of prepare for you. Um, and, I, and so last night I thought, metaphor, metaphor. And kind of, she, talk, she talked to me about um, the wheel. And there are so many metaphors that we could be using. And so she had told me, think about a metaphor. And I went, oh, um, I've thought about a lot. And there's something we call a supplice. Um, how can we describe the supplice? It's not really a medicine wheel, but it's a, the whirlwind. Yeah. And as being a metaphor, we talked about on the ride up here. But um, George is a great professor. She doesn't let us get away with writing papers. She said, um, what's your visual? What's your interpretive dance going to be? Okay, I'm getting it ready. <laughs> so this is a Georgia assignment. It's true, Georgia. Don't laugh. Um, she asked us for her analyzing and critiquing qualitative research. We had to graphically organize our entire research project, but it couldn't be. Remember, it couldn't be. Such, it couldn't look. I thought, oh. Um, and I did sing the Beatles this time. But I came home and I, and I described to my husband, here's my dilemma, here's my challenge, here's where I want my research to be, here's the paradigm shift I'm trying to make, here's my, you know, and here's my social security number. And I mean, it was, and he said, um, ta. And some of us know what ta means. And um, tiwa. And, and I had given him a few other ideas of what would represent, like our esoptikai, which is a rawhide carrying case, and I use it as a lesson plan for my students of what do we put inside that. It's got a hard case. Um, we keep things that are of value in there, and I always tie it into their educational goals. And I thought, oh, that just seems like, and he said, the teepee. And I wanted to share this. This is what you have. Um, I wanted to share it with um, Rodney because I realized in the car with Angel that when you look at the center of the poles, the tiwa of our teepee, you see the spokes intertwined. Mm -hmm. And there is no way you can set up a teepee. You start out with a nimifu four. You start out with four strong foundational poles and then you build. And so my husband and I had this wonderful conversation the night before my assignment was due <laughs> on this metaphor of my conceptual design of my research for Georgia. And it all, it's there. No matter where you are at in your own studies, you will find what fits you. And that is no different than what we're doing in, in indigenous research frameworks. And I don't want to get all into this. You've had it on your lap for a while. But I'll just tell you, there's a, here's the visual side. And then all the writing that I couldn't help is on the other <laughs> side. Um, she tries to get it out of me, but it still ends up in there. Um, so <clears throat> the TP poles are the Tiwa. And I can't ever get Peyton out of my head. My teacher hat always pops on my head first. So when I think of my research, it always goes down to what do I want for my students. And so when I thought of the TP poles, I think of my kids. And I think about their journeys. And so the poles are those support mechanisms. You're a pole. Um, and the TP poles represent my students' foundations, their success, sense of place, community, self-efficacy, academics for Peyton, um, basketball. Mm -hmm. And the poles support one another, another, and the Tiwa is the center. The Tiwa is the center of that. And you can see a very beautiful image of that with the sunshine. Um, and as you go through life, your Tiwa, you add Tiwa to that student's TP. Now, how many of you know in the College of Ed is there like schema and scaffolding? I mean, you use some connections there, being teacher-like. And so these poles are supported at the center. You can't put up a TP with just one pole. Um, I feel like I'm doing that every day in my own classroom, but I'm like, let's get some more poles in there. And so it's all, all four have to work together and you're expected to add um, to it to make that foundation stronger. That's my teacher hat. And then when I think about me as a researcher, what are my poles? 
mom methods. Ha ha. So this is where my husband and I, because he doesn't have the same terminology. I, he says T Y. I say okay, methodologies, methods, my epistemology. Okay, that's that's tamalit. So I'm making these connections with our TP cover being our indigenous theory and our worldview. The fire being what we call tamalwit, the law. It's that divine principle that makes us nimipu. Only I have that. Um, you probably have that. Renee has it. Peyton has it. But we have that. Um, how I construct my teepee is my methodologies. Um, I don't know how the crow do it. Some have three. A teepee is pretty international, right? Kind of a global phenomenon popped up everywhere. But how do we do it? We have our own way of doing it. It is different than even if I look at the Chopai or the Coeur d'Alene, they do it different. So even if you have a culturally responsive, get back to my research, culturally responsive curriculum you think might work in your classroom, mm -hmm. you still have to make it your own. Um, it's like borrowing somebody's tent. It's still not yours. So I, I hope I'm explaining myself. I need to stop talking. But the last thing are those stakes. And, and um, the stakes of the teepee are when you peg it down and it is held to the earth. And just think about that metaphor. And what that means, we talked about ancestors, we talked about, um, this is kind of my, my little decolonizing. When the colonial winds blow through, the various <laughs> elements of relationality are those stakes that keep that teepee grounded. <laughs> and when I gave this beautiful presentation to Georgia and was so excited, um, and my, we have a teepee for our boys, and had the beautiful stakes, and my husband tied them um, together, the whole time I was giving my presentation, what was happening, Georgia? It was on a weird platform. Yeah, it was on this table, and did it stay up? No. And so my friend Dan Campbell said, well, Delisa, you are, don't have your stakes in the earth. You're trying to put it on what kind of surface? I went, thank you, Dan. <laughs> so um, I will stop there. But just wanted to share that metaphor that it is very much like the spokes of the wheel. And this is the very beginning introduction of my journey. And I've got a long trajectory to go. But um, I'm laying those bricks as fast as I can. <laughs> Before um, Lynn goes, I just want to, uh, of course, um, uh, thank Delisa because she's, I'm fortunate to have uh, Delisa as my son's teacher. Mm -hmm. um, she's, oh, uh, one of the main things I wanted to, uh, to, to do, I don't know if you, you've read it in, the, in her bio, but it's an important thing that we, I, I want to recognize Delisa for, uh, and, and you'll have to correct me if I'm wrong, but she received a pretty prestigious award last year. And if you can go, go ahead and name what it is, I just want to brag about you, but I don't know it, so you brag. <laughs> Bruno Mars' girlfriend. <laughs> oh, no, that wasn't it. <laughs> I am um, um, Idaho's Humanities Teacher of the Year. And then do you have a website? I think you, cause she has a real cool website. Oh, yeah. Yoda's on it and everything. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And so you might ask her about that. She has a lot of stuff. Okay. All right. So um, like Delisa and Angel, I'm going to start with where I am at. And the best way for me to do this is to read it. So bear with me. Sure. I'm, and I'm also going to start with a quote um, drawn from the National Board on Graduate Education, um, 2001 citation from Gonzalez. The Doctor of Philosophy degree, the PhD, is the highest academic degree granted by American universities. As professors, PhDs hold a unique and influential role of preparing society's future professional leaders, specifically through the act of teaching, they are responsible for the preservation and transmission of knowledge. In a similar vein, they are central to the social process by which culture is preserved and transmitted." End quote. My work examines knowledges and knowledge production in the field of education from a critical race gendered perspective, drawing from critical race theory, 
an indigenous ways of knowing and Chicana feminist approach to research. Broadly speaking, this examination is relevant and pertinent to institutions of higher education for many reasons. First and foremost, this inquiry is grounded in a work that seeks to make the world a more just and equitable place, beginning with the classroom. For me, this begins with where I am at. Currently in my second year of a doctoral level program in the field of cultural studies and social thought and education in the Pacific Northwest. Secondly, it is pertinent to recognize that despite the increase in participation of historically marginalized and muted communities within education, the numbers that earn their bachelors, let alone their doctoral degrees, is still grossly underrepresented. Thirdly, this underrepresented attainment of educational degrees has direct impact on societal influence, leadership, and ultimately power. In other words, as a classmate of mine shared in Georgia's class, if you are not at the decision-making table, you are on it. Margaret Kovach, Margaret Kovach's work, chapter six in particular, of indigenous methodologies, which is titled, Situating Self, Culture, and Purpose in Indigenous Inquiry, provided a much needed space to examine my own positionality as it pertains to locating myself as a woman of color researcher in qualitative research. Quote, experience and research told me that indigenous inquiry involves specific multi-layered preparations particular to each research, clarifying this inquiry purpose, which in invariably gets to motivations. Motivations such as, why did you do that research? Why did you do it that way? Kovach's questions provoked me to make this necessary time and, sp and space to reflect upon my own positionality. According to Kovach, self-location means cultural identification. For me, this means I am a great granddaughter of a single Spanish-speaking only mother, mother from Guadalajara, Jalisco, Mexico, who left her country for reasons unknown to my family. I am the great, I am the granddaughter of a mother who claimed she was born in the United States, actually born in Mexico, who chose to elevate her Spanish blood by dyeing her hair blonde and wearing blue-green eye contacts, all the while calling me her little Pocahontas. I am the daughter of a mother of two by 17, her highest level of formal education, being seventh grade, who loves her children more than her own life and has taught them lessons a formal education does not make room for. I am a monolingual Mexican-American woman who identifies as Chicana because of my indigenous history, blood, and consciousness opposed to that which entangles and suffocates. In the words of Chicana activist scholar Gloria Anzaldúa, I recognize that colonization may have, in, may have destroyed our indigenous civilizations, but colonization could not eliminate the evolution of an indigenous psyche. I am the great granddaughter of a lineage of single mothers who have raised their children without their biological fathers. I have inherited a line of ancestral amnesia induced by English-only federal policy and aggravated by the economic and political landscape of the American Southwest. I claim, I claim la, la conciencia, the conscience of the mestiza as a method, a tool that offers us hope to move from a bleak present into a promising future. My consciousness has been shaped by my community and my own lived experiences of marginalization within dominant mainstream cultura. I speak too white for some and not proper enough for others. Anzaldúa states, the mixed racial bodies and minds that we've inherited usher that past into the present and more important, into the future. As a student, I recognize my racialized and gendered experiences within the walls of academia, 
not as a high cultural experience, but as one daily cognizant of my own space and how it collides with common sense notions of interaction and protocol within the walls of academia. All the above, all the things I just said, have powerfully shaped my interaction with knowledge within the context of formal education. From this nexus of power and education is where the examination of knowledge at the doctoral level from a critical race, gendered perspective, an indigenous ways of knowing, and Chicana, Chicana feminist approach to research continues. Hawaiian indigenous scholar, Dr. Manulani Meyer states, we do not leave our communities when we go to school. Our communities come with us. Her words convey an experience many underrepresented scholars embody when they enter the walls, when they enter the walls of academia. For them, as the first in their families and their communities, their journey ahead is very much like uncharted territories with new customs, languages, ways of interacting and knowing. For these scholars, the knowledge they have lived, breathed, and embodied from generations of living and interacting with this world is like an invaluable compass which has guided their journeys throughout their formal education. Unfortunately for them, this experiential knowledge this knowledge they have from their communities and cultural wealth they have of their communities, their histories, their ways of knowing, is the most powerful irony of their journeys within the academy. These anchors and scaffolds, these anchors and scaffolds of strength and specificity, as Kovach and Wilson's work reminds us, are required to be checked at the door once they enter the classroom discussions of validity and objectivity within the knowledge producing factories of doctoral education. From this prestige of doctoral le level education, marginalized scholars continue to advance into the walls of academia and come face to face with institutional procedures and standards which have historically misrepresented, misrepresented and stigmatized their communities from the van vantage point, from the vantage point of and for the sake of the academy. This is why it is essential and imperative to have such institutional spaces as Dr. Georgia Johnson's indigenous knowledge and research models and education course from the fall, which allowed my class colleagues and I to articulate and braid our unique and specific positionalities and ways of knowing as the common strand which links us to this transformative work. We recognize that we are not the first to be doing this work, but it is essential for our current generation and those to come that we continue this work. Sean Wilson describes the elements of an indigenous research model as the ontology and epistemology that are based upon a process of relationships that form mutual reality. The axiology and methodology are, paced, or excuse me, are based upon maintaining accountability to these relationships. An indigenous research model is relational and maintains relational accountability. From this place of community, all actions are accountable to those relationships. This approach to research clearly defines itself from traditional approaches to research, which are used against and over communities. Incorporating, this is a quote by Margaret Kovach, incorporating this good way to do research, the privileging of story and knowledge seeking systems means honoring the talk, to provide openings for narrative indigenous research researchers use a variety of methods, such as conversations, interviews, and research sharing circles. Once individuals have agreed to share their story, the researcher's responsibility is to ensure voice and representation. These indigenous ways of knowing approaches to research model a reverence to specific epistemologies rooted in unique interactions with the world and ways of knowing. Further, it holds the researcher accountable to these stories, communities, and lives it interacts with. For the indigenous ways of knowing approach to research, it is not viewed, it is not viewed as a hit and run approach, but a relational and accountable contributions, contribution to the needs of others. Quote, story 
as methodology is de decolonizing research, end quote, by Kovach. The use of story, centering the experiences, voices, and ways of knowing for historically marginalized communities is an act of resistance to the traditional framework of research. Through the use of storytelling as a research method in its various forms, the responsibility of the researcher becomes authentically and respectfully representing these stories in collaboration with the storyteller. Further, it is the hope that these stories will contribute new ways of knowing and interacting within academia, relevant research projects that directly meet the needs of their community and to allow a space within doctoral education for us to begin to truly hear and see others from their own voice. Dr. Manulani Meyer states, how I experience the world is different from how you experience the world and both our interpretations matter. This is an important point as it links inevitably to transformative policies, awareness, and pathways to liberation via our own articulated epistemologies. The framework in which the American educational system was created, this is my opinion of course, invariably sorts, sifts, and predetermines that which is deemed valuable and rigorous knowledge at the expense of indigeneity, which posits a wider evaluation methodology that extends from what is seen to what is also not seen, but felt, experienced, and understood. Through such opportunities to engage with indigenous knowledge and research, like Dr. Georgia Johnson's class, the historical effects of modernization and progress on generations of communities of color are now called into question. Critically questioning and engaging with everyday practices and norms within educational institutes allows much needed room for essential growing pains to produce new ways of understanding and validating what is just as important in educational discourse, indigenous ways of knowing. In closing, this opportunity to sit alongside these women has reminded me why I am here. Like Margaret Kovach, Sean Wilson, and many other activist scholars, both on this panel and on the front line within academia and our communities, I am here to bear witness and be a reminder to who has not been able to speak, produce, be authentically represented within academia. We recognize, I recognize, much has been produ produced on our community's behalf and at our expense. We are here to physically embody and practice these everyday methods as a mean to work toward the creation of yet another culture a new value system with, with images and symbols that connects us to each other and the planet. Thank you. Like my colleagues... One of the... the parts of uh, all the learning that took place in the classroom with in George's class and, and this class that we're part of was really understand what that means for us. Um, I, I am Mexican. I was born in, in the state of Michoacan um, in Mexico. Uh, my family left Mexico like many families searching for better opportunities. Um, as a five-year-old, I, I remember I have some memories and those memories are still very much part of, it, it very much affect the way that I see and understand things. Uh, I remember being told that we were going to go to this place called El Norte, that we were going to immigrate north. I remember seeing my family, uh, my aunts crying. I didn't understand what this meant for us. Um, my father had been in the States for a while working, and my grandfather had been coming up here as a guest worker. Um, my mother one day said, you know what, I'm, I'm, I'm tired of being here. I want to go up there because she was always alone in Mexico. So I, I remember when we took that decision to come up here, 
or my parents took that decision. Um, and the, the, what I imagine as this north, it, it was really this vague, dark thing in my mind, but I, it didn't make sense to me why people were so sad. Um, they told me I was going to be on this airplane and that I was going to fly somewhere and then we were going to arrive and I needed to be my, pretend to be my, um, my uncle's daughter. So my, my brother and I crossed being my uncle's children and while my mother crossed through the desert in Arizona and my father met her on the other side and then came over here. So I remember being in that car um, and uh, thinking and telling myself over and over again, I need to say that's my dad and that's my dad because my family really scared me that if I didn't say that was my dad, I was gonna go to jail and I didn't know what that meant, but it was pretty scary for me. And um, so I have those memories. Again, I was five and a half years old when we came, but I, I remember that. Um, I, I knew, even though I didn't know what it meant to go to the Norte, I knew somewhere in me there was a big part of a big change and it was going to be big. So all of that, you know, thinking of where we come from and the struggles that brought me here and the reasons that we came up here and the, the, the struggles that my family kept, kept going, living. Um, you know, I was raised in California, I lived for, there for 11 years. and. Um, then we, we, we moved up to Washington, really running away from, from a lot of the um, problems that we were fe facing there. We, we came back to Washington with a truck load full, full of things, and that's all we had. We sold everything else. Um, so my life moving from place to place is a big part of how I understand research and how I see myself within research, talking about place-based knowledge you know, and, and that. Um, so for me, place has a, 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 it's a very important part of myself as a researcher. Mm -hmm. So I am Mexicana, I am Mestiza, and I, I am Chicana in, in mind, you know, in consciousness, the way that I understand and see myself. I'm bilingual, and, and that's another part of the way that I, again, see myself within research. Um, and so something that, for me, it's, this class allowed me to do, it allowed me to breathe. Um, last year, as a second year doctoral student with a Lynn's cohort or, and um, culture studies program, it was very difficult. I mean, it was, it, it was, it was a lot of great stuff, but it was really difficult because there was a lot of those moments where I, you know, question, I still do that. I still wonder and question why I'm here, what am I doing, and I have all these questions. Um, but in this class, I, it reminded me that the conversations we had, that I can use stories, you know, and that stories can help me heal. Because as, as a, a Mexicana immigrant, mestiza, there's a lot of healing that I, that I am searching for. And in this class, I, was, I had that space to think about that. And, and again, I had that space to really breathe and connect with my colleagues at a different level. Um, I thought about the stories as myself as a student in my whole life, always having this passion for education, but always having this love-hate relationship with it. Um, I was always that student that had the good grades throughout you know, my whole career as a student. But there was a lot of questions, and I, and I have those moments, and I think of those times when I had those questions as a student where the answers they were giving to me, somewhere deep inside didn't really satisfy me, but I just kept going with it. Because somehow I also learned that I needed to just go with what I was told. For instance, one you know, day I, I asked um, a teacher, it was, I was really young, whenever we learn about dinosaurs or something, <laughs> whatever the time that was, I asked what, how the dinosaurs were there and when the whole story with God and Eve and all that, it didn't make sense in my mind. She just stood there and looked at me, didn't give me an answer, she just kind of walked away. Mm -hmm. And it just always, always like, kind of stood in my mind, this question that I always had. Um, you know, or even asking, as I'm going through history class, I'm asking myself, I think it was middle school, you know, asking myself, and I remember having this, this, this thought, um, why, why am I not seeing somebody that looks like me in the history book? And I asked myself this, and it's so painful to think about it even today because I gave myself the answer that, well, there was probably nobody that was that anything good enough to deserve to be in the books. And, I've, and I not only asked myself that question, but I believed it. And so throughout my 
my career as a student, that was always something that kept happening. Um, had these questions, and then no answers were given, or the answers that were given didn't satisfy me, but I wasn't able to really question. Going in through that, I wanted to teach. You know, do, when I did my undergrad, I was initially going into um, secondary education, um, but but there was something missing, and it wasn't until I left this place and I went to Mexico and I went for four months that I was got saw myself away from all these things that I was able to finally open up and really see that I I needed a space where I could ask questions, you know, and and ask critical questions, um, and I needed to have conversation, and I needed to be with people that I could di have dialogue with. So I came back and I stopped doing that, you know, that, that degree, and I went into something else, and you know, somehow then I ended up here. Hmm. And so, and as I was mentioned earlier, it's, it, it came at a perfect time. You know, I am where I'm supposed to be. And I'm very thankful for, for all the experience in the class, because again, it's, it, it really, has been a big part to how I feel right now at this moment. Um, one of the metaphors that we talked about in the class was the idea that trenza, you know, the, the braid, and so that really stuck to me because I I am really in this struggle to to wave to weave um, Chicana feminism, you know, critical race theory, and all those other theoretical perspectives that, that fit to me with all these indigenous research methods, methodology that I've learned in this course. So that's where I'm at, hoping to, like a, like a braid, weave all this together. Um, and then I wanted to share a quote that uh, Gloria Anzaldúa too, and, and I always think about this quote. And um, it says, I am visible, see this Indian face, yet I am invisible. I both blind them with my beak nose and I am their blind spot but I exist, we exist. They like to think I have melted in the pot, but I haven't, we haven't. So with that, it's just, that's, that's part of how I see myself, that's all the stories that I remember my family telling me, all these questions that I've had, and um, this struggle to decolonize my mind even, you know, um, wondering, looking at my parents, my, and all those questions that always came up and, and how my father is darker skin than my mom and all those things and, and just sort of all those questions and, and trying to make sense of that, trying to make sense of this really internalized colonialism, right, that, that I'm really trying to heal from. Um, and I, you know, also really think about those people, my family, my community, what has brought me here. Um, as Lynn said, you know, you bring your communities with you. But then you, so I come into this space with my community, um, with my family, and then I, I am in a, in a place where I feel that there's no space for all that to come in with me. There's no space for that to sit there. So, so I'm finding myself crashing against all these walls, right, of, you know, research and all these things that just sort of make me want to burst. Hmm. But, you know, and for, for that reason, Spaces like these are very much necessary. Um, my mom, as I mentioned earlier, is the biggest reason I'm here, my whole family, but my mother, her and all the lessons she taught me and taught my family, she's, she's the backbone of my family. And um, one day I, I had this uh, conversation when I was in Mexico doing my study in, in Mexico. I talked to her, I called her, you know, my normal, uh, a phone call a week that I did, and we had this conversation, and, and she told me something that forever stuck to me and, and reminded me that she somehow always just keeps me on check. She said, I was talking to her, and she, she doesn't speak English, so we're having this conversation in Spanish, and I'm talking to her about what I was doing, what I was studying, all these things, and then my mom says in Spanish, she says, ay mija, she says, you speak so well. And everything you say, us uncivilized people will never understand. And so it was that moment where I, you know, it was just huge slap in my face, right? My, my own hand giving myself a slap in the face. Mm -hmm. And I think about that day and I question, you know, what is it that, that my mom, that makes my mother think that she's uncivilized, right? And those questions of what it means to be civilized versus uncivilized. And, 
you know, but, but for myself as a researcher and for myself as a student, as a person, it's just thinking about that. I'm in this, I'm in this journey to really um, use research to heal myself and help my community, my family heal. But then, am I, how, how much of what I'm doing, is it me or how much is it other things that are, you know, coming at me? When I speak, is it me speaking or am I using the words that somebody else is giving me to, to tell me that, that I, need, I need to use those words to really valid, be valid, right? So when, when my mom told me this, and I think about this every time I'm in some sort, in any situation, I always think about that thing because I don't want to be um, that person that makes somebody else feel that way, right? Um, <coughs> But at same, so it's at the same time, it's it's just a constant struggle, and that's where I'm at. I mean, I was planning to read this paper, but I'm not. I'm just I'm just speaking right now. Um, so I, so just my mother keeping me uh, on check, and always reminded me to be to stay humble, no matter what. Stay humble, um, no matter what. You have respect for others. You have respect for your elders. You have respect for each other. Um, you listen, you hear to what people are telling you. So all these are lessons that they are so part of myself and my understanding and the way I see the world. And, and so it's important for me to be in a place where I'm able to, to practice this, where I'm able to, to speak and feel like others are listening. And then, um, because I know that I will listen, right? But then I'm also in, sometimes in other places where that doesn't happen in the academy, where that doesn't happen, where we're not, sometimes we, we just speak just to speak, you know, we, we say all these empty words, um, and then we forget to really listen to each other. Um, so with that, just research is ceremony for me, when I heard that by Sean Wilson, it was just this huge aha moment for me, because last year being in this you know, struggle of all these questions. There's moments where I really was like, maybe I need to just get out of here. I just can't be here. You know, then I would feel better, but then I would fall back to that. Um, that idea of research, when I came into here, I still had that idea that research was this cold, you know, objective thing that I didn't want to be part of. Um, and so, you know, people around me were always telling me, think about it this way, think about it this way, but I didn't really begin, I, to, to process that until I heard that research is ceremony, and it can be ceremony, right? And you could celebrate, and you don't, you know, you work with people, and just that idea of, of working in a collective and you not being this researcher, as I had imagined or felt even after I'm told otherwise. Um, so for me, every time now that I think of research, I think about that. You know, I think about the possibility of me as a researcher to, 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 to make it a celebration and to use that research to heal. And I think healing is a big part of it for me. Um, using research, using story to heal. Um, allowing myself to, um, or, or thinking about what indigenismo, in, indigeneity means, and then uh, how it lives in my body, in my spirit, and, and I am Estisa. But a lot of my traditions, a lot of the way that I was taught about the world is very much from an indigenista, from an indigeneity perspective, a worldview and understanding. Um, so one day in a class, we had this part of their class was to reflect on their, some of the readings and um, another huge aha moment for me was um, I was reflecting on this one piece and you know I'm writing away and as I'm writing um, all these things that I was saying just started getting to me and everything from the rest of the class started getting to me where I just stopped and started crying mm -hmm. and I just started crying and, and that, the idea that I was able to do that and the work that I was doing just got to that level um, it was, it's, it was, it's powerful and it, it's needed that's really when we start really opening up and really learning of our, what we really are, you know. And again, we need to understand what our, what our story is, you know, what is important for us. So I started 
just crying away, just tear, tears started flowing, and it was just one of those, I was shaking, I wasn't doing any of that, it was just tears were flowing. And instead of writing what I thought I was gonna write, I wrote something else, because that came to me at that moment. And I allowed myself to do that, just write what was coming out. I put that in that paper and I turned that in. And I was okay with that because I knew that it was okay to do that. But, it, and, and even though it, it wasn't how I thought it was gonna be, it was better because I just allowed myself to be in that space in that moment. Um, and so with that, I will stop talking. <laughs> but with that, um, that's what I wanted, what I'm at, where I'm at. I'm allowing myself to really just be in the space, in this place, and enjoy you know, the, the, the people that are around us in that moment. Um, but always keeping in mind all those lessons and, and family and what's important for you, uh, what's important for me, thinking about my family, my, my mother, uh, my past, my grandparents, the stories they've told me, my memories in Mexico, my, my times in Mexico, and that importance that Mexico still has to me, just all that history, cultural, all those connections, keeping that in mind and in my heart all the time, but yet living that moment, I think, is helping me um, mend my relationship with research <laughs> and, and help, is helping me really visualize and start to see myself actually as a scholar and um, as an activist scholar. And so because of that, I think I'm okay <laughs> and I'm gonna be able to keep moving forward. So with that. Thank you. Wow. <laughs> I'm just really amazed and um, I'm really, I feel really fortunate and blessed to, um, you know, just listening to these women and each of their stories and how um, bringing it all together in um, this journey that we're on and what it really means to um, embark on the educational journey from an indigenous woman's perspective, um, just starting with Angel and coming down to Delisa and Lynn and Chave. Um, I just have a, I mean, I, I have respect for them, but at this moment, I'm just sitting here thinking, wow, this is so beautiful. And um, I must give thanks and props to Georgia as well. And um, just, you know, listening to their stories, um, it, you know, it, it's, it's taking what I had intended to share and what I've been working on, um, you know, into another area that I think is really important to address and just share with you all and to thank you again for coming here and listening to our stories. Um, and I'll just introduce myself a little bit more. Um, my name is Renee Holt. Um, I was born in LA and the first half of my life I bounced around in the southwest so I was raised in the southwest of Navajo land in Diné, Diné And so I am you know blessed with being the daughter of a Navajo woman and also having a Nez Perce father and I am enrolled in the Nez Perce tribe um, and my Indian name is Lycanyat and it belonged to my great-great-grandmother. And originally, I think we had envisioned the slide showing throughout our whole presentation, <laughs> so you would have seen pictures of them. But um, my, my experience begins with, you know, becoming, being a, a daughter first, I think, and a granddaughter, and a sister, a friend, auntie, eventually a mother. Um, and now, you know, I, I have nieces who have had children of their own, so I'm a, you know, in the Indian way, I'm a grandma. And um, I'm thinking about all these stories and listening to these women and, and what I was fortunate to have called my, my life story, I guess, up to this point. And I feel like, what's the most important thing to share? And um, and I want to just preface this with, um, especially after hearing Chave and Lynn, who, you know, they broke it down using some of the, the uh, some of our class readings, but Manulani 
Meyer really stands out to me at this time in saying that all dissertations are healing. And there have been times in the program where I have become, you know, filled with emotion. And sometimes it wasn't all happy. Sometimes it was frustration. And there are some times where it was peace. And then there are other times where it's just more questions. But listening to these women talk about, um, you know, what they've experienced really made me think about, you know, what, what does it mean truly? And to have supportive faculty, um, staff, just at, you know, at the administrative level, and, and how much work it took to keep and even have this class for us to have this experience, I think that's really um, poignant in, in, as far as what an indigenous woman's perspective can include. And I've been, you know, I had a class facilitation earlier on um, decolonization. And I, you, uh, you know, I resourced. Um, it's wasasi. I'm not really not sure how to pronounce it, but it's wasasi. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, I, I, I heard the word decolonization earlier, and Delisa shared. You know, she's a teacher, and um, she wanted to decolonize the classroom, this room that we're sitting in. And I thought, you know. That word is something I'm going to become real familiar with. I'm going to just embrace everything about it. And it's not a pretty picture. It's really not something that has a beautiful story. Um, in fact, there's a lot of healing that's required. And I think that's what we're going through. I believe that we're totally coming from different areas. And, um, you know, the indigenous worldview is something that's so, it's tremendous. And, and there are so many spokes in that wheel that Rodney shared, a, a, he gave this visual, and um, there was a picture of a wagon wheel. And I was thinking, there are so many spokes in that wheel, and there's too many to me at some point. You know, I'm thinking, well, usually wheels don't have that many. But as I started thinking more about what our experience was like, each of us was a spoke in that wheel and each of us had um, a unique experience. Um, the first half of my life was spent in an urban area. I would go back to the res in the summer times, um, not by choice. Um, I remember being left at my grandma's, and um, my mom didn't have a sitter, you know, and so she worked, and so we'd get left at our grandma's, and, um, and then we'd go back to school, and I lived in, you know, went to school in a boarding Probably for the first couple of years, I did go to a boarding school, but we eventually moved to a border town. And um, this, my, my experience has really brought out racism, uh, experiencing an internalized racism, um, and that healing, that grieving process. Um, it was really difficult a couple of semesters ago when I was coming to terms with knowing what tribal critical race theory was, you know, and um, I heard some random person say, it was a bit of a, a question of, you know, some people go to university to learn about who they are. And it was a critical observation, actually. And I thought about, you know, I, I actually had that experience. And um, today's presentation in which um, Chave and Lynn are in my, uh, are in where we have a class together in that. And um, we talked about what decolonization is. And, and um, a lot of it, you know, is based on personal experience and that journey and, and what what it means to to decolonize really, you know, goes back to experience and going tracing back when I started experiencing racism, how it brought my brought me to this institution and how I view the academy to how I even read books. And um, when I heard about research as ceremony last year at the globalization conference and I heard Delisa and her colleagues and their, pro their cohort talk about it, I became really interested and thought, I gotta take this, I gotta read it, is all I thought, I gotta read this book. And um, I got the book, um, but it wasn't interesting to just look at it and see it and have it. And when I heard there was this class, I was like, you know, we gotta, we gotta do, we have to do something about this. We've gotta have this class, how can we get this class? And um, I recently met with my professor, and she was talking to me about my cognate and what that means. 
and how um, classes that we take need to be relevant and we need to break down how this class helped you, how that class may or may not have. And I was really excited about this class and I thought about, you know, how am I going to present this because it isn't a major required course, it's not part of my core. However, it was one of the most relative and most um, probably eye-opening as far as indigenous methodologies and research is concerned. Um, I happen to be taking with Chave and Lynn also um, uh, a qualitative research class the same semester and we found ourselves having these parallel experiences. And um, we talked a lot of story. We talked a lot about our, our experiences and what these women are sharing with you is exactly what our classes have been about. You know, <laughs> we made assignments like, you know, you need to write your positionality paper and you need to write, you know, what is it your framework will be? And we were all like, oh my God, what is that? You know, what does that mean? And, um, you know, and our professor's like, where do you come from? What do you do? You know, where did you learn? What do you understand? And as we started putting it onto paper, we, were, we, we had this moment of, wow, that's my positionality. Wow, that's what that's all about. And indigenous methodologies really came to that place for where we were able to, you know, take off our hats, sit down, put on, you know, that, I guess the, I don't know, I was going to say moccasins, but <laughs> everyone has their own something, you know, the girls, they had their braids, and, and um, we even had some of our own, um, I guess, personal items. And um, that's indigeneity. You know, all these things were coming together, falling into place. And when I heard that line from Manalani Meyer that all dissertations were healing, those few, those little words made me cry. I mean, I was like, oh, wow, that, that's exactly what this is. And um, I was really, you know, thankful for um, Arthur, who's not here, um, because he helped me. Um, he reminded me in so many words. He was like, you're Nest Purse. You should know these things. And you need to remember, you know, there is an MOU and you have a class requirement. You can do that. You can take this class. And um, hearing that, I thought about what does this MOU really mean? What is the, um, you know, what's this based on? And, um, it, you know, it, it's evolved every semester into something else as far as classwork has been concerned. But last fall was really probably one of the semesters that I, I found direction. Um, and I think that's probably, you know, relative to, you know, hearing um, Chave talk about finding her identity and finding that conscious. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, we're not taught that. We're not taught that in the classroom. Um, we're also told that it's not possible to be here. You know, the odds are going to be against you, that marginalization, um, the adversity that you're going to um, experience. There will be, you know, uh, challenges, and it'll become a statistic, you know. And when, I, when you grow up hearing that, um, there's a part of you, at least I can say for myself, there was a part of me that believed I couldn't do it as well. And, um, and so when I hear, you know, these women share their story, I'm thinking, I, you know, I shouldn't be here. I, I should not be here based on everything that I've been taught, everything that I've been told. And then I think about those pictures and I'm like, well, you know what? I. I'm walking on the shoulders of my ancestors and the women before me. And that's why I'm here. And so, you know, coming around full circle and hearing, you know, Angel talk about her grandmother and Delisa just finding her place and using the teepee. It's funny because um, <laughs> I, I wrote about, you know, relative using the teepee earlier today and I thought, you know, it, it, everything all comes together the way it's meant to, exactly when it's supposed to. And um, I think that's what I, I, I find most important to share as far as what an indigenous woman's um, experience or perspectives are. And, and 
I don't have a metaphor. Um, I know that was something Angel was sharing, you know, find a metaphor. And I was thinking, you know, what would a metaphor look like, you know, on a panel? And I feel like these women shared with you enough story to, that, that would, you know, impress your worldview on what it truly means as an individual, especially as an indigenous woman, that this is a journey that you will take on your own and um, your story will come out. Um, you know, I have, I come from two different tribes. They're so diverse. They speak two different languages. Um, you know, having growing up been around Navajo, I understood a lot about Nez Perce before I even come here and just learning words. It was a lot easier and um, understanding and knowing that that really, that's something to attribute to, you know, a, a family way of life. And, um, without knowing that. I didn't know that that was important. I didn't know that was valuable. I, I learned it much later. And growing up, you know, not, wanting to, I guess, not be a part of that, feeling that internalized racism. There were times where I wasn't proud and I didn't like and didn't think being an indigenous person was a good thing after hearing all these, you know, there, just, there are racial slurs I remember. And now when I look back, I think, wow, if I knew how to take care of that or how, what, or what to say or what I would have shared or what I would have told my mom, um, you know, how we could have handled that, I would do it. But, you know, it, it broadened my experience. And now that I'm a mother, I think about my children. And, you know, I'm, I think, or actually I believe, I'm certain that where I'm at is for them as well. It's for my daughter because I'm a mother now. And mm -hmm. she looks at me, she listens to me, and she watches me. All the while, she's playing a game, you know? <laughs> she might be on her Xbox, but she's listening to me, she's watching me, and um, I introduce her to these women, and you know, and I tell them, these are your aunties. And that's how we're forming our little family away from home. Mm -hmm. And you know, they come in and they see these ladies, and that's what I want her to gather. I want her to learn from that. I want her to know that these women struggle in a different way than I do, but they're here for me the same way. And Georgia, you know, it's funny. She she kind of downplays this, like, oh, I didn't do nothing. Oh, you women are the one. Oh, you know, but. She's out in the trenches so that we could be here. And that really is a testament to having supportive faculty, supportive administration, and um, also just hearing and knowing I get to see and meet you in person, but I remember emails about getting our class. And um, did it correlate Pam? She was very nonchalant about it, like, oh yeah, I just know somebody over there. <laughs> Pam is our faculty at WSU. That's her she husband. She was like, yeah, <laughs> might somebody you might, you know, you might need to talk to this person. Um, but you know, it, it, it really it, it it was a it was a moving time when we learned. And believe it or not, you might not think of it that way, but we we're like, oh wow. It was such a respectful manner that she didn't use that in any way at all. It was, uh, you know, you do this on your own, you get through this paperwork, and you meet this person, and it'll get through, and it'll work out. And we're like, OK. Um, and we got this, through this class, and I believe halfway through the class, um, I think we, we had this, we, were, we would commute um, back and forth. And we would always have our pre-class and post-class discussions. <laughs> and um, on one of our trips back, and we have a colleague who's not here. He's a guy. He said he said something that I thought was really, you know, it 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 was really touching. Um, but he said, when the men step aside, when the men stop, and let the women lead, things get done. And <laughs> I thought he was being funny, like jabbing, you know, little jokes at us, but he was serious and um, he said, if you just let the women lead, we're going to be okay. And um, I was thinking, wow, you know, this is a confident man. He's really awesome. He could say this. <laughs> and um, I, I was thinking, you know, we do have this blessed 
opportunity as, as you know people to help make differences out there and um, every one of us is doing something locally and um, regionally and someday nationally um, we're all going to be graduating and we'll be looking back and reflecting back on this time and we'll be off somewhere I don't know where I know <laughs> Delisa and, An and Angel will be here in the Nespers community and I'm not sure where Lynn and Chave will be going but we're definitely <laughs> going to be off you know and um, this was really a poignant time for us I believe this class um, validated us um, we heard our voices and we saw them on paper we heard other women other indigenous scholars out there in the world of academy um, where it's not so friendly to women in general and so when you see a, a woman of color um, other than bell hooks you know <laughs> she seems to be all we're out there but you know for me wanting to know who's margaret kovach you know and and, and why, why don't we have any um, American Indian women scholars? Why are we resourcing First Nations women? You know, I, I, and, and why are we looking at First Nations um, you know, scholars? Why, why is that? You know? And um, you know, it, it, it became a call to action, like, well, we've got to get busy. We've got work to do, ladies. You know, we have some stuff to do. And um, I, I think that was really the turning of the leaf at that stage. And so. Um, you know, I won't go so much into the MOU as I originally intended. Again, I told the ladies the other night, I was like, okay, this is what I'm going to say, this is what I'm going to do, talk about. And, um, you know, it's funny when you, you tell the future what you're going to do and it kind of turns out somewhere else. But um, I'm just really thankful. I'm really am, uh, just <coughs> blessed to have this opportunity to work with these women and thankful and appreciative. And, and I thank all of you for coming and sharing this time with us as well. So, gift of course as we shared our, our our stories and we have I have little gifts for those who who came Aww. and these are uh, uh, my brother Abraham's artwork and their postcards so anyway it's this art artwork so before you leave come and grab Carol grab a postcard nice. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. before we leave because I'm always thinking about how you guys can make my job in my classroom easier um, <laughs> And I am starting there, so hopefully by the time they come van become vandals, they'll have this mindset and just <laughs> beware that your pedagogy better have shifted by then. Um, we're fifth graders, um, just beware. So, and I want to embarrass um, Dina and Jane, but when we think about um, Georgia helping to create this opportunity and then helping us to have an international stage and then seeing um, that we're this grow and it's not just here we have such an opportunity I don't want to let it go Dr. Gregson I don't want to let it go Rodney because um, we're flagship I mean who else is doing this this is important for us I know Georgia mentioned was it UCLA she got like a bit of it you're doing an indigenous whatever from you was it UCLA yeah and when I went to Hawaii, my husband and I got to be in an immersion school um, and in, a Honolulu, in um, Oahu and, and be in one of the first ones and, and meet with the teachers. And at that time, I was in George's class because I skipped class to go to Hawaii with my husband. Because <laughs> I am new, you know, I'm, I'm going to be in a classroom um, and brought back that presentation. And she said, you're in what class? Doing what? Um, 
how do I, is it online? I mean, we have this need for this coursework to be happening, and we have the resources here, and we're generating those change agents. Um, I haven't called myself an activist, uh, but I'm going to now. You are. Um, <laughs> um, I just want to um, express that from a fifth grade classroom to the administrators in this room to um, even you know where Jane's at, this isn't a course for indigenous people. Um, this is a course for, we've had professors. Um, so I, I, know, I know it's late, and, um, but I, I just feel like um, having Jane and Scott and Dan and people from around our university be in our course with us on this journey is where that change is going to happen because we can't do an indigenous research framework without shifting the paradigm of our institution. Mm -hmm. So you could help us be that seed of change. Mm -hmm. And Shannon and Jane and Dina should stand up and there were and there are um, six other people who are not identified as American continent indigenous who were in the class with us and have continued to be our partners and have continued to use parts of indigenous research, primarily methods, in-depth storytelling with their um, people they're interviewing, analyzing it as story rather than as data. So we, we've uh, had some wonderful allies in the class also. It, and it was open, although originally when we talked about it, and the, then Dean of Cog said, we will be sued because, you know, white people can't take it. I said, I never said white people can't take it. We will be sued. I was like, everyone calm down. There will be no litigious moments. Um, if recorded. anything, these women will sue to get their land back. But, um, you know, there won't be these big in, in moments. And, and so we've had, and as I said, there were um, six men with us in the second course who were not here tonight, and they were all instrumental in um, this journey. And in fact, Frank Finley was the one who taught us the braid metaphor for bringing us dog bane and we spent a whole class making dog bane braids and showing the incredible strength of this reed when it's braided together and at the end he said now sit down and I'm going to explain to you the epistemology, axiology and ontology of what I just taught you. And so he taught us from the Salish perspective first and then he went into Western philosophy and it just stuck with us. It was We were all very impressed with that lesson that day so that's where the braid originated so it, it's been a gift from the creator and a hell of a lot of trouble to get organized <laughs> so I, I would just like to extend my thanks uh, certainly we're not there yet as a college or as an institution uh, but because of your efforts we've made some movement and it makes me more hopeful and with my colleagues across the institution uh, we've huddled more than once probably with the emphasis of Georgia, uh, <laughs> thinking how we're going to do this. And so thank you for uh, facilitating that. Lovely to hear all your stories. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for sitting. Thank you. Thank you.